Good evening, everybody. My name is Juliana Camfield. I'm the director here at Deutsches Haus at NYU. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our conversation tonight on H.G. Adler's The Wall, a conversation among the translator Peter Filkins, George Prochnig, moderated by Eric Banks. Several years ago, my husband, who's American, asked me, have you ever read H.G. Adler? And I have to admit, I drew a complete blank. Uh, I had never heard of Adler, which is uh, retroactively very astonishing. But I learned that I'm not the only one. And uh, unfortunately, I have to say, many people here and also in Germany uh, are not as aware of Adler as they should be. That question caused me to do some research and to find out more about Adler's life, uh, to look into his uh, novels. And I was so delighted to find out that uh, Random House has uh, published uh, three of them at this point. Uh, and uh, of course, we'll, we'll hear more about it tonight. But uh, it was really astonishing. And of course, I think there are reasons why Adler is not as familiar to a larger audience. And, uh, and I think we'll perhaps find out uh, a bit about why that was, uh, and perhaps, perhaps still partially is the case, but obviously all this is about to change with the publication of, of The Wall now. Peter Filkins is an acclaimed translator and poet. He has published four books of poetry and eight books of translation, as well as numerous poems, reviews, translations, and essays in Partisan Review, The New Criterion, the New York Times Book Review, the LA Times Book Review, USA Today, the Iowa Review, the New Republic, Poetry, the Paris Review, and numerous other journals. He teaches writing and literature at Bard College at Simons Rock in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and translation at Bard College in Annandale on Hudson, New York. He's currently on leave to uh, work on a um, H.G. Adler biography at the Leon Levy Center for, for Biography at CUNY's Graduate Center. And of course, he's the translator of The Wall and also of uh, The Journey and Panorama uh, uh, by H.G. Adler. George Prochnik's essays, poetry, and fiction have appeared in numerous journals. He has taught English and American literature at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, is editor-at-large for Cabinet Magazine, and is the author of In Pursuit of Silence, Listening for Meaning in a World of Noise, Putnam Camp, Sigmund Freud, James Jackson Putnam, and the Purpose of American Psychology, and most recently, of course, um, he wrote The Impossible Exile, the wonderful Stefan Zweig uh, biography, and we had a great event on May 1st here at Deutsches Haus. So welcome back, George. Um, and last but not least, Eric Banks is a writer and editor based in New York. He's the director of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU. A Mississippi native, he graduated from Columbia College and pursued graduate studies in anthropology and linguistics at the University of Chicago. A former senior editor of Art Forum, Banks relaunched Book Forum in 2003 and served as the publication's editor-in-chief until 2008. Banks' writing has, ap has appeared in numerous publications, including Book Forum, the New York Times Book Review, the Financial Times, Slate, the Wall Street Journal, Aperture, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. He has also served as an editorial consultant on numerous catalogs and collections of artist writings, including the catalog accompanying the Whitney Museums of Arts retrospective of Jeff Koons and a collections of the writings of artist Paul Chan. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you all for braving the cold to come out tonight. Um, I'm going to try and get us started with a few questions about H.G. Adler because I imagine that uh, that many of you are, like me, relatively unfamiliar uh, figure to, to many of us. It's a pleasure to have both of you here this evening. I'm, uh, uh, George, having written so well on Spike, is, has already written about someone uh, who seemed to produce more words uh, than there were minutes in the day. And that certainly applies to H.G. Adler as well. I'm astonished in talking to you, Peter, just to, to realize how much writing he did. He produced 2,500 pages 
a fiction within about a five, year per five or six year period immediately after World War II. He left us with 1,200 pages of poetry. And these are all activities for which Adler was really not known in his lifetime. Um, 26 books he wrote um, over the course of a lifetime that began in 1910 and ended in 1988. Um, and to the extent that he was probably known when he, when he died in 88, it was as a scholar of the Holocaust. Um, you've managed wonderfully with your two previous translations and with the book that's just come out to introduce us to Adler the Artist. And I'm wondering, that seems like such um, uh, an, a, a unique phenomenon to be, uh, to excel in such disparate uh, types of writing. Uh, I wonder if you would say a little bit, just to, by way of introduction to us, about Adler the Artist and, and Adler the Documentarian. Sure. Um, <clears throat> before I answer, I, I do want to uh, put a, a little plug in for Deutsches Haus, and that is to say, uh, in the uh, early 1980s, uh, I used to live in the East Village, and uh, uh, one night or two nights a week, I've forgotten now, I would uh, tromp across 12th Street um, to take German lessons uh, at Deutsches <laughs> Haus. Uh, and uh, they were wonderful classes, and I just did it to sort of keep up my German, and, uh, and later went on, didn't even know I was gonna translate. No, it was just something I wanted to do. And uh, went on to, uh, after graduate school at Columbia, went to Vienna uh, to tr and ended up translating the poems of Ingeborg Bachmann and, and uh, a couple of novels by her, uh, and then came along to Adler afterwards. So to be here is lovely because it's a kind of long, circular journey of uh, 30, 35 years. I was um, hoping you'd say you learned German on a dare, but... No, <laughs> no, no. Uh, no it was, I, I was... It, longer story, no, no, but... Anyhow, uh, Adler, yeah. I, I think one of the most unique things about Adler is... Uh, the amount of ambition he had as a literary artist and as a scholar. Um, his first book is a thousand page monograph on Theresienstadt, Theresienstadt 1941 to 1945, The Face of a Coerced uh, Community, and publishes it in German in 1955 and actually gains quite a bit of renown. Uh, it is one of the first uh, scholarly hol Holocaust books that we have. Uh, and he was already writing it when he was in Theresienstadt. Uh, he goes to Theresienstadt in February of 1942, spends two and a half years there with his wife, uh, Gertrude Klepetar, who was the head of the, uh, the infirmary in Theresienstadt and was responsible for saving many hundreds of lives uh, through her own care. And while he's there, he starts collecting documents uh, of how the camp was run, uh, different bureaucratic uh, letters and uh, materials that would come through Gertrude's office. And he already knew he was, if he survived, he was going to write a scholarly study uh, of the camp. He goes on to Auschwitz uh, for two weeks and then a camp, uh, Niederroschel, which is in the area of Buchenwald, and then uh, Langenstein, would, uh, he was in Niederrussia for uh, four months and then Langenstein for four and a half months. So he survives Theresian stuff for two, two and a half years and three other camps before coming back to Prague in 1945. He entered the camps as a writer. He aspired to be a poet and uh, a short, short fiction writer. Musicology. And musicology, did his degree in musicology. His uh, doctoral thesis is on Klopstock und die Musik. Uh, very interested in the Baroque uh, him, uh, himself. And uh, comes, and he's already writing, he starts a novel while he's in tradition start too. Uh, uh, Raoul Feuerstein, his, his novel has not been published. Uh, he ends up writing seven novels altogether, only four of which uh, have been published. Uh, these three and then one other. Uh, called Hausordnung, which is a kind of satire of bureaucratic uh, societies. And, uh, uh, and constantly is writing poems. He writes 130 poems while he's in Theresienstadt in, in rhyming quatrains, uh, very tightly sort of uh, uh, Heine uh, kind of uh, very intricate kinds of rhyming uh, uh, within them. So that's what I find the most astonishing thing. I can't think of another if you will, major writer, and I think Adler is a form of major writer, um, who also does major scholarship. He later publishes another thousand page study 
on the, deport, the entire deportation system. It comes out in 1974, uh, the Verwalter Mensch, uh, administered man. Uh, and so just on that score alone, uh, it's kind of astonish, astonishing. While also writing 10 to 15 pages of letters per day for 40 years. Um, uh, and I'm writing a biography, I have to read them. Uh, <laughs> so, fortunately, they're typed. <laughs> um, was he, was he, so he was writing these uh, simultaneously after, after yeah. uh, during and after the war. Yeah, I mean, he always wanted to be a writer. That's he and uh, oh, was part of the, well, a, a, a literary writer. Yeah. That's what he aspired to. He published his little book of poems in the 1930s. Uh, and he was part of, he considered himself a part of the Prague circle of writers, which of course the most famous is Kafka. Uh, and uh, another very important poet and anthropologist, Franz Bermann Steiner, was his best friend. We, you don't know much of him over here, but he, uh, he dies in 1952 in Oxford uh, and uh, was in Oxford throughout the, throughout the war. But they, they, nonetheless, there was a small coterie of literary types, if you will, in, in Prague. Um, but because of his experience, he had to do something about it. And he was, he was, for the most part, not terrible, well, he was, I don't want to say he was unable to publish his novels in his lifetime, yeah. but they, they went through a very uh, uh, long and difficult uh, period of gestation at publishing houses yeah. in, in Germany. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I know from talking to you earlier, he's, he's still not terribly well known in Germany no. to this day. No. Um, he, he has a very hard time getting his work published. Uh, the first novel he writes is Panorama, uh, completed in 1948, uh, and it's not published until 1968. Uh, the second novel is uh, Eine Reise, a journey, but he always wanted it to be called Die Reise, and uh, I restored that in, in the translation, so The Journey uh, was written in 1951 and not published till 1962. Uh, in fact, there's this, uh, Peter, uh, the great publisher, uh, Peter Zorkamp, said, as long as I am alive, this, this novel will not appear in Germany. And it was true. Um, Zorkamp dies in 1961, and uh, the, the novel is published by a tiny little uh, publishing house. The, the, the publisher even said to him, I'm not the publisher for you, but this ha I, I, I can't support the book. I can't help with its distribution, but this novel has to appear, and I'll do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, The Wall was completed in 1956, was not published till 1989, a year after Adler's death. He never knew it was gonna be published. He did, it wasn't like it was in galleys and he, as he died, he, it was arranged after his death. Uh, and then, as I say, there was uh, another one, a Household Noon was published in 1968, no, I'm sorry, 1988, uh, which was written about then. That was mm -hmm. the one more contemporary. Um, but there's another 500-page novel completed in uh, 1953, and two other 300-page novels which are completed uh, right after the war as well, and they're all uh, in manuscript. What, what, what do you, why do you think it's so difficult for him to find uh, uh, an audience for his work, uh, yeah. whether it's within publishing or outside of publishing in, yeah. in, in Germany after the war? You know, two, I think there's two reasons. One, he, he's a, a, a very, I would describe as a modernist writer, a very multi-voiced, uh, very rich in his style, uh, and particularly with the journey, which is very fabulous in its in its construction. It's sort of uh, I don't want to say um, magic real magical realism, but uh, it, it has qualities of that. And at the time, people wanted realistic novels. Um, if you did anything that was aestheticized on the camps, you were not telling the truth. Um, and this was just not accept acceptable at the time. Was that uh, Sir Comp's, um, uh, Yeah, that was his objection. That was his, his objection. Uh, you know, the, I mean, he, uh, Adler knew Adorno, and you know, the famous statement, you can't write poems after Auschwitz, which we know is, you know, flawed to even, it's not that simple, it's, I mean, Adorno later retracts that statement. And, um, but nonetheless, Adler deeply believed you have to use everything. You have to use fiction, you have to use poetry, you um, have to use essays, you have to use radio essays, which he did a lot of, uh, and you have to use scholarship uh, to come at it any way that you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And they uh, disagreed on this. They, 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 uh, there was correspondence between them. He lectured in Frankfurt at uh, uh, the university. Uh, in Adorno's uh, symposium, and 
so that was the other thing, you know, that was it. It was just, no one was ready for yeah. this kind of novel. Secondly, I asked Jeremy, his son, whom I'm very uh, much in contact with, I said, you know, come on, you know, what happened? What? And he said he was a man who got in his own way. Um, he was not good at the marketing. He was not good at shaking the right hands. He was extremely stubborn. Um, and he would not belittle the material by selling himself and you know doing all the things that writers and publishers and you know we all know what the business is like it can you know it's it, how do you separate art and, and business and Adler had a very hard time doing that mm. um, and yeah. then he was in London yeah. that was the other factor you, you, you mentioned his son uh, Jeremy Adler is a very well known uh, German scholar um, yeah. and has done quite a bit to keep his father's work alive. Very much, yeah. yeah. I mean, he worked very hard to get the novels reissued. When I came on the scene, I, I found Ayn Rais in the bookstore. It, it had just been reissued in 1999 in a beautiful edition. Uh, and uh, Jeremy's worked very hard to, to do that, almost completely alone. Mm -hmm. Because again, no one, I, the only German writer that I know of that knew, knows Adler's work was, is Mikhail Kruger. Um, the head of Karl Hanser Verlag, and in fact, Adler's novels are published by Jolnai Verlag, which is a subsidiary of Karl Hanser. And uh, Kruger actually knew Adler. Uh, he had met him several, several times. But beyond that, you ask German writers, and they've never heard of him whatsoever. Of course, the great exception is W.G. Sebald, right? Uh, because Adler appears in Austerlitz. Austerlitz wants to learn more about uh, Theresienstadt at the end of Austerlitz, about, because that's where his mother dies and he reads this book by H.G. Adler. If you read the novel, in fact, that's what happened to me, yeah, you, 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 think it's, you think it's a made-up character, you know? <laughs> you just think, oh, okay, he, just, he chooses this guy. And, and then the map in uh, Zebald's Austerlitz is Adler's map of Theresienstadt. In fact, it was done, it was dr drawn up by his wife Bettina, who was an artist herself. But if you open up that book up, and you look at that map, it's kind of got a dark shadow uh, going down through the middle of it. And, and uh, if you go to Adler's map, a five-year-old could Xerox it and make it clear. Um, so like, where did the shadow and stuff come from? Uh, this is a story. There was a conference on Zebald at University of East Anglia where Zebald taught. And I was talking with one of uh, the people at uh, East Anglia, and they went into the copy room and said, did you ever know this guy named Max Zebald at all? And the people in the conference said, that guy, he was always in here saying, make it look old, make it look old. <laughs> and apparently this is what he did. He, do he doctored the map to give this kind of patina of, you know, uh, uh, detritus or something. Yeah, so, so, so. which it's very, I mean, I think when he does those things, I'm not indicting Zebald. I mean, I think when he does those things, it's saying, I can take you so far if you need to go farther, you're going to have to go to Adler, uh -huh. because they all, of course, didn't go through the experience. And you've told the story before, but it's such an interesting one. There may be people who, who don't know this. I mean, you talked about how you came across the work. Uh, I, I think when we were talking earlier, I asked you uh, how it was that you were able to get it uh, published in English, uh, whether it was something that, that, you know, once you were interested, once you were translating it, you found it. Uh, a ready publisher and an easy publisher, and, it, and in fact, it didn't. And it was really the Sabal connection that I think may have interested uh, your editor initially. Yeah, um, some some may know the story. I was in Schoenhoff's foreign language bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and pulled Anna Liza off the shelf, read two pages, and said, "I have to do this." I knew it right away. I mean, I, and it wasn't the subject matter. I'm not a Holocaust. Uh, scholar, or uh, it was the music, it was the writing, it was the the, the sense, of the voice that that I heard in those pages, and I, you know, it was a beautiful edition, and I had never heard of H. G. Adler, and I thought, you know, but he's here, he is in Schoenhaus foreign language bookstore in Cambridge, and I thought, well, you know, this won't be too hard, and mm -hmm. some, you know, Holocaust novel, and those come out quite often. It took me 40 publishers and six years um, uh, to finally get a contract for it. Um, and it was really, uh, the, the, the greatest fortune was being at the American Academy in Berlin where I translated the first 100 pages without a contract. Um, and uh, it really needed that. It was such a difficult book and such a demanded book. It, it kind of needed the first 100 pages to convince somebody. Mm -hmm. And then how it happened with Random House uh, was an uh, editor named Paul Taunton, who's uh, since moved on, uh, but 
emailed me and it had been at Random House sort of floating around and Paul emails me and says, is this project still available? And I said, yes, and I'm gonna be in the city next week, perhaps we can meet up and we did and, and you know, uh, Paul was very young and uh, I sort of realized this was not one of the top editors at Random House and it kind of, you know, freed me to say, Adler's important because, <laughs> and just sort of laid out the whole thing. What I didn't know was that he was a Zabald fan. <coughs> he was a huge Zabald fan. And uh, he saw the connection and saw the import of the work right away. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that, that uh, work to get acquired at, at Random House, which, and I have to say, Random House has been wonderful. Sam Nicholson and before him, Lindsay Schwery, and uh, they've done a beautiful, beautiful job, uh, particularly on, on the wall. Well, it's a, it's a really beautiful translation. And Thank you. One of the things that's fascinating about the wall, I think, for, for people who for, were first aware of the translations of, of uh, Panorama and Journey uh, when they came out in 2008 and 2009, will be, I imagine, how different this book is in texture, in, uh, in direction, in ambition from those other two books. I, I, I think you said that these were not referred to probably as a trilogy, or you don't know a reference to them as a trilogy during Adler's lifetime, but, yeah. uh, but they're very much presented as one. But how, well first I would like you to say something about that, about how this book differs, and then if you want to just read for a little bit to give us the texture of the, of the, of the book. Then. Sure. Um, yeah, I think another fascinating thing about Adler is he invents a new style for each novel. And I don't know a lot of writers who do that. Uh, Panorama is a, a very realistic Bildungsroman, coming of age story of a young boy who's born uh, right before World War I in, in, in Prague and is educated and it's told in 10 different scenes from uh, Joseph Kramer's life. Uh, all the way up through uh, pre-war days, forced uh, labor on a railroad, and then uh, Langenstein, and then eventual uh, exile uh, in, in England. And it's very, very realistic and very rich in detail and, and pretty straightforward in, in many ways. The journey, as I say, throws you right in the middle of the surreal nightmare of the Holocaust itself, the uh, family Lustig, named by the name of Lustig is deported from, again, a town called Stupat, but you'd realize it's Prague, and uh, most of the family dies, one son uh, survives uh, at the end of it. And then the wall is uh, sort of psychological realism, I would might describe it as. Uh, it will switch into dream, it will switch into memory, it, there, will be, there are scenes with uh, cocktail parties with uh, post-war uh, intellectuals in, in London. Uh, there are memories back to Prague. There are nightmares. There are bucolic memories of walking in the Bohemian forest of Western Czechoslovakia. Uh, and it's sort of somebody's consciousness being mapped out um, in, in the pa on the page and uh, in, the, in the novel itself. Uh, I can tell you there's another great, the other great novel is called Dian Siedlung, The Settlement, it's not published. 500 pages long, and it's kind of Kafka meets George Orwell. Uh, it's a description of a settlement, a town, uh, which is very, very sort of sci almost science fiction, uh, surreal, very philosophical, um, and a completely different style mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. uh, to give you a flavor of the wall, I'll read a passage. This is sort of two thirds of the way through the book. And Arthur Landau, uh, who is born in Prague and ends up in London, survives the camps, ends up in London, uh, but keeps thinking back to Prague all the time. Uh, and after he came back from the war, he worked in the Prague Jewish Museum, which Adler did himself. Now, the Prague Jewish Museum was founded in, I think, 1922, 1920, um, uh, to, for, to celebrate and catalog and preserve our Jewish culture in Prague, and then was taken over by the Nazis, specifically uh, Adolf Eichmann, uh, in order to become a museum for a people who had been exterminated. I mean, it's so astounding. A lot of people don't know this. Uh, and they collected all the artifacts from, from the deportees and cataloged them and warehoused them in, in the magazine, and in the, in the museum. Uh, they had dioramas with wax figures uh, holding satyrs uh, and uh, religious uh, uh, 
ceremonies. Uh, and the idea was to, to preserve this culture mm -hmm. as, a, as an artifact. Adler comes on the scene after the war and ironically enough is actually trying to preserve the culture. <laughs> In other words, the, the, so he ends up switching the, helping to switch the museum back around again to try and preserve the artifacts uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. Except it was very, you know, very difficult work and very troubling work. Landau is in the middle of this and is working with Frau Dr. Kuka and Herr Schnabelberger. And uh, yeah, Adler loves names, uh, uh, making them up. Uh, and they're talking about the problem of preserving this material and the problem of history. I had to promise Frau Dr. Kuka that I would not refer to the paintings as patients or as students. For us, there was only an inventory with many objects. This and nothing else was the proper approach of a museum that wished to concern itself with history. I could see what she meant and didn't want to cause any difficulties, but what one meant by history was to me unclear. How can you say that, Frau Doctor? History, and yet we are standing right in the middle of it. I don't see what your problem is. Not my problem, but rather the problem of history. Do you need a definition? Not really. I'm not interested in abstractions, for I don't trust pure philosophy. What really riles me is the difference between what was and what is, where the past ends and where the present starts. In between is something that is unsolvable and inexplainable. Am I too dumb to understand? But Frau Doctor, said Herr Schnabelberger, we're all that dumb. I don't understand either. And we're in agreement. I say yes, one can't explain it. There must be a bridge to the present, and that disturbs me and gives me no rest. Just think, yesterday something happened which the whole world talks about because of how many people it touches today and will touch for a long time. When is it something that happens, and when is it history? They listened to me, Frau Dr. Kulka thinking before she answered. When it occurs, but has already happened and is already over, then it is history. But of course, it has to be designated as such at some point in order to be known. And you have to bring it into a museum when it is adequate and can still be transported, when you can call it historical evidence, right, Frau Doctor? Yes. But often it's still alive and has not gone by. As an object, it presents itself, is there, or I would say is manifestly there not as a piece of evidence, but as a witness in itself, and yet it's supposed to be an object. Please don't think it mad or paranoid obsession when I also find it haunting and horrible. I disagree completely. All of us, all of us here together, our history. Then a museum is a good place for us, joked Herr Schnabelberger. You are totally right. We are remnant survivors who are there for all who are not. That's true in general. The living are there for the dead, for their predecessors, and thus we also represent the history of the dead. How difficult it is then to exist as oneself when we are also history, so much history. But we are particularly there for all those dragged away by force and annihilated. You know what I mean, those of whom not a trace. We are the history of the exterminated, the history of the shadow that consumed them, and we collect what was stolen from them, what we can store up of their remains. But that is indeed alive and really not history. It amounts to neither memory nor keepsakes. It is commemoration. It really hangs somewhere between history and an event. A fragile condition, yes? And with that, hopefully, I have explained well enough why it occurs to me to speak of the portraits as patients. I think that to be I think I take that to be my charge, and so I see those who have been painted as living and possessed of a fate, indeed as persons, not at all as objects. And it pains me to think of how badly they live here among us, badly locked up in cages and castigated, covered in layers of dust, while the blood of those murdered can hardly be washed away. Those exchanges uh, give you just a little taste of the extraordinary richness of this novel. I have to say, just up front, that I was staggered by this book. It's, it's, it's easy to read, even if 
disorienting constantly. It, it sucks you in. It has a, when, a mesmerizing rhythm. When you mentioned picking up um, the journey in the bookstore and, and being immediately absorbed in the poetry and the music of the lines, I, I have to say, I, I was constantly taken aback by the, the m mesmerizing <coughs> lyricism that he achieves, whether it's in passages of dialogue, passages of description, passages of reflection, passages of, of anguish. And I think that the exchange that, that you just read from gives, gives a sense also of just how philosophically rich this book is. I mean, it's, it's quite extraordinary because you, you brought up Adorno, or I guess Eric, uh, you, you, or mm -hmm. maybe it was Peter, but that, that, um, that idea of, of what it means to write poetry after Auschwitz, after the camps. And there are many points in this novel when I feel that Adler is grappling with that question directly. It almost seems at times like a massive, um, a massive comeback to that gauntlet. Uh, which it ultimately has to be seen as, that, that Adorno throws down. Um, so I, w I wanted you to talk a little bit about this philosophy, but I want, I want also to, uh, hearing you read this now, I want to I wanna bring up just one more moment. Just, I, I've, I've changed my mind. Do you, do you mind reading just, just one, one moment from the, on page 187? Because it seems so, uh, so opposite to what you just read, or I guess it's 186, when the, the idea of, of memory. Because a great deal of what's happening here throughout the book is the narrator's, uh, or not the narrator's, but Landau's um, occasionally uh, crippling efforts to understand whether memory is something that should or shouldn't happen and what it means to remember in the context of an event of this magnitude and this depth of 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 loss this this kind of a vacuum what it means to remember what it means to remember a void and there's there's this section that or a set of sentences that you're going to read now works with uh, the historical reflection i think very well yeah um just to sort of set it up a little bit um Adler lost 18 family members uh, in the uh, Holocaust. Um, he and his wife, uh, his, he was in Theresienstadt with his wife Gert Gertrude and her parents. Her father dies in Theresienstadt, and he and Gertrude and her mother are uh, deported to Auschwitz in October of 1944. On the ramp, the mother is selected out, and this, as was often happened, the daughter couldn't bear to think of her mother going to her death alone, and so she went with her mother. So he says goodbye to Gertrude uh, on the ramp. Um, and so that's to say the kind of void that we're talking about here. And this little conversation uh, is with uh, jo jo Johanna uh, in the novel, who is the stand-in for Adler's second wife, Bettina, who he knew in Prague and had told to get out in 38. Um, she leaves with her siblings, leaving behind her parents, and her mother and father die. Her, her father dies before the war. Her mother dies in Theresienstadt with, uh, with, with Adler. Um, no, he doesn't die, but that's where she, she dies. Um, Adler says after the war, if I can contact Bettina, this woman, and I can mean anything to her, I can go on. He finds her address in 1945. She finds his address. She's in South Wales, um, uh, hiding out for the war. Their letters cross in the mail, their first letters to each other on the same day. Um, he writes to her, and she writes to him. Six months later, later they are engaged to be married by mail. Um, and she, he writes, to, he proposes to her in a letter, and she says, oh my gosh, what have you done? Uh, and then she accepts. And, and uh, so he le go, leaves in 47. Uh, and this is really about their love story, that, um, the, the love story of, of Johanna and, and Arthur and how she sustains him. I cannot rest, let alone find peace. Thus, there can be no escape. But memory is something else altogether. It's the identification with the deportation and all its consequences, therefore with those who suffered extermination. 
That I can't do. At best, I was broken, perhaps shattered, but because I indeed stand be before you, I was not exterminated. She says, at best? Isn't that bad enough? Yes, bad enough, but to be exterminated would be better. So you don't want to live any longer? Oh, no. I very much want to live, perhaps even too much so, but only my own extermination could amount to a true memory of what happened. I, I mean, I just think that's a remarkable <laughs> dialogue. I, I, you know, and it's, it, I, I couldn't help thinking at different points in this book of, of Proust, because memory and the process of what summons it and what, what contains it is, is so central. But if in Proust, this vast project to recover the past is in some way a defeat of time and a, and a, and a, and a, and a resurrection or endeavor, we understand from this that there is nothing to remember except nothingness here. Right. I mean, and that the closer you get in a, in a Heisenbergian fashion in something, the, more, the less there is. I've never seen that articulated, but it seems, it seems in itself one response to, to be able to articulate that is already a gift against what Adorno was afraid of. And I, and I would say further, um, to bring up t what, you, what you touched on for a moment, much of the novel, in, in it, particularly, I guess, I, in the latter, third latter half, concerns um, Landau's efforts to uh, gain some kind of support, help to, to continue. Because this is in, in London. This, right. this is, this, uh, much of this book is, is really, it's a, it's a book about, it's a book about afterwards. It's yeah. a book yeah. about, it's a book about exile and the life after right. as much as it is. And which, that's one thing we want to emphasize. Which is why it's a trilogy, I see it as a trilogy, right. right? Panorama is the lead up to, the journey is the immersion within, and this book is about the coming out the other side as survivor and, and mm -hmm. exile. Yeah. yeah. So. And there are scenes with, uh, we, we believe at least, uh, recognizable uh, caricatures of, of figures like Adorno right. um, and George Steiner right. and the Canettis. Yeah, the Canettis yeah. mm. And one thing about those scenes uh, w w that I found is sometimes they just have a disarming humor, a, com sure. a completely surprising yeah. satirical edge. But the 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 main thing that happens over and over again and there are there are exceptions but the main thing that happens is that he uh, he's not supported that people don't help him huh. that people are in fact terrible and pompous and caught up in their own celebrity as the representative figures who survived and have something to say about what happened in Germany and there is a way in which I thought that the the the, the other side of not being, um, not being able to remember unless you're dead. The other thing that he seems to put forward against Adorno, and, and give me your thoughts, but he shows the ways that this extermination continues. Yeah. And it is, of course, and very expressly so, not in the same manner. He's not comparing George Steiner to a commando at a camp, but these these people who do not know how to help, whose hearts are too small and whose egos are too large, perpetuate it. So if Adorno says you can't write poetry after the camps, we see this individual here struggling to exist, being exterminated in small ways, but small but ultimately mm -hmm. um, potentially final ways by being unable to sustain himself. Right. And it goes on. Right. So there is no afterwards. Right. Yeah, uh, boy, <laughs> a lot in there. Um, yes, uh, I want to say, before I beat up too much on Adorno, Adorno actually arranges for the subsidy for the Turasian Stop book. He actually raised the money for the Turasian Stop book to be published. He also wrote a critical letter for Adler to get very small uh, reparations after the war. So Adorno did help Adler, There's, that's very clear. Um, and, and he didn't ban writing. Poetry no, no, there. right. <laughs> right. Well, compared to barbarism. No, no, no would he, yeah, no, would he have at, at all. And he very much admired the Turgenev stuff book, um, mm -hmm. unquestionably. Um, at the, then, secondly, yes, the Kennedys show up. Uh, Adorno shows up. Uh, 
they all have sort of funny names. Adorno was uh, Professor Kratzenstein um, at a, in a cocktail party. Just and, slightly better than um, in Dr. Faustus when he's the devil. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, uh, and uh, then, but also Franz Bermersteiner, Adler's best friend, whom he revered and who was dead at age 42 in 1952 of a heart of a heart attack, uh, shows up as a character named So and So, uh, uh, Lawrence Cowders, uh, and he's terrible to him. He 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 says your work is old fashioned. It's uh, you know, it just won't find any audience here. Discourage. You no, know, you should go. You know, get a menial job someplace. And so. I think what it's about is is real. It's two things. It Adler didn't get sup the kind of support that he had hoped for. Uh, he didn't have the kind of career that he had hoped for. He lives in penury, part particularly in the 1950s. Uh, there's an astonishing. He used to keep keep little pocket calendars, and in fe on February 9th, 1952, he he just writes scrawled across the page. Was ist geistige Arbeit? That's it. You know, what is intellectual work? What is scholarly work? Um, and then the, the journal stops and for three years before he picks it up again. And I'm thinking, what? Huh? You know? <laughs> and went back to the day before, February 8th, 1952, 10 years in England, and what accomplished? And so, that's when he asked the question the next day, what am, it's basically asking him a question, what the hell am I doing? I'm working every day on this Theresienstadt book. I'm trying to write novels. It's going nowhere. I'm poor. My wife is doing menial work to feed the family. I've got a son. Uh, and he's kind of at his breaking point. Uh, he describes being hungry for years and years because the post-war rations were good enough for someone who was healthy, but not for someone who had been through the camps. Um, and he was just constantly, constantly hungry. So there's a lot of nothing to try to give voice to, um, and it's so deeply seated. I think one of the interesting things to point out is there is very little violence in his novels. No, that's, there is that's very crucial. little about the camps. Um, these are not horrific novels. That, you know, you're, I mean, they're, they're compelling, yes, um, mesmerizing, but they're not viscerally horrific. Um, it's as if he kind of doesn't want to go there. It's, it's as if he wants to leave a void around that black hole of horror. Um, and I think this passage is critical because he survived. He did not experience the camps in their truest horror. He would have had to die to yeah. do that. The fellowship of death. And, and he has to pay honor to that because he's not part of that fellowship. Mm -hmm. He's not part of the fellowship of death. So, yeah. um, does that? You had a lot going on there, George. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. no. I mean, that, de that definitely um, addresses what what I was thinking about. I wonder, I wonder what you've come to feel reading and translating his work and, and now working so hard on his bio biographical material about him as a person because his temperament, there, there is something about him where, where if, if not optimistic, yeah. Yeah. He, he seems to have something slightly transcendent, which yeah. is remarkable that it can coexist with such a, a felt physical world. But there's so some way he floats he floats down the river. I thought of that the character in Lansman's film in, 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 in Shoah. I can't remember his name, but the but the the man who goes back thank you, yes. And is singing as he goes down floating down the river. Um, and and there's something a bit like that. Do you agree that uh, Yeah, no, uh, a word that keeps coming up in Adler is Ganada, grace which would seem an astonishing word uh, to come up in, the, in this. And, but he, he profoundly believed in grace, in something coming from beyond this world to sustain life, to sustain life in this world. Uh, and he felt he had experienced it. Not, not he himself individually being, being chosen, uh, but somehow life went on, somehow life, people, People did survive, and they had a duty. You know, the end of this book is about Johanna and Arthur trying to make a new beginning, um, literally as a 
Adam and Eve, they re he refers to themselves in a kind of... Would you say something about the use, the use of Adam as a, as a trope throughout? Well, again, I think that's that spiritual religious element in, in Adler that is always there, that transcendence, uh, that Adam, you know, carrying the original sin and, and being expelled from paradise. And, and just for those of you who haven't seen it, there, there are repeated moments when he, the Landau actually seems to hear himself, see himself as, as Adam. Yes. Right? He, I mean, critically, again and again. And, it, and he seems to be, to me, both as to, to have come at that both with a conception of a new beginning and also as the last man, right? Yeah. It's a first and yeah. it's definitely a Janus faced. Adler had a profound sense of the importance of the dig dignity of a single human person. Uh, there's a great story. He's in uh, Langenstein and he realizes he's about to get a beating uh, from one of the guards. He says, just a moment, could I remove my glasses? They're very important to me. He folds them and puts them in his pocket. And the guard goes nuts, <laughs> you know, just. <laughs> but it was that moment of to maintain his dignity, to say, I am here, I know you're going to beat me, I am going to prepare myself to be beaten, and you cannot control me. Um, and this is, he writes about this in essays and says that in the camps, an experienced eye could pick out those who had lost their sense of dignity, who had lost the sense of themselves. He said within two weeks they would be dead. Um, you, could, you, you got to see that, this, that somebody, someone would give up on the inside and then they would quickly get ill or get themselves in trouble or, or, or uh, be, be killed. So this is how he got through. This is how, this, the sense of trying to maintain, and luck, and good health, he realized that, and you know, he gets to Langenstein, and they ask him, what do you do? I am a scholar, he answers. And of course, they realized he could type, so that put him in the office, rather than deep in the mine. Langenstein was an underground uh, mine where they uh, assembled airplane parts, uh, and so this is part, he becomes a, a Schreiber, uh, 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 a camp you know, uh, writer, uh, secretary. Um, so the sense of being who he was and, and of himself was deeply important. And it wasn't because of ego. It was that each individual human being was, was absolutely sacred and vital in their own dignity. And in some way, he seems to know and have enough sense of self to believe that by modeling it, as it were, with some action like the removal of the spectacles, that it's not only for himself that he's being an That's individual. Right. That's right. It, it seems communicative. That's right, yes. It was, uh, he, he felt himself to be an emblematic person, an emblematic survivor. He was not surviving for himself, but surviving for others who, yeah. who did not. That's yeah. b beautifully put, and I think that's a that's something that comes through again and again in the way in the way that events happen to this character, who doesn't, it, it, Landa doesn't view himself as innocent, and yet, and yet he knows he knows there's a purpose even to the ways he stumbles. Sometimes with his children, for example, he should speak a little bit about perhaps the the, the actual family that he's part of and his uh, responsibilities to it and his sense of failures towards it. Yeah, there's Joanna, the the wife. And then two children, Michael and Ava. And uh, Joanna clearly is taking care of the children, and he, he might walk them to school, and that, that's about it. And he actually feels he doesn't want to be too much a part of their lives because of this darkness. And he he's, wants to keep this darkness from them. He doesn't feel that they should be burdened by it, um, that it's his job to, to manage this darkness, and another that they should go on grace. to live their lives of another form of grace. They were innocent, they're sweet. They should remain so, uh, and the book ends with someday. If you read this, Michael and Ava, I hope you'll feel that, uh, you know, I was a decent person and <laughs> trying to handle an impossible task is basically what he says at the end. So he's not one to th think that this was the only subject matter known or or should be known to to human beings. That hum hu human experience is much greater and vaster, and and there is. There is happiness. There is grace. Yeah, that's, there is that's the one thing you should definitely. Alive. I mean, I, th I think that's that's come out very clearly is that it's not, it's not only a dour novel. I no, mean, no, it's, it's no, actually no. it's a love story. There's, yeah, there's a love story. It's a love story. There's a uh, there's there's a lot of humor in it. Um, and 
We talked when we talked earlier about what passage you might uh, you might um, uh, read to us. There was quite there were so many because the tone is so varied throughout the novel, which is one of the things I think is also really interesting. I mean, one whole other texture of this of this novel, which Peter has beautifully translated, is um, descriptive, and 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 the role of nature in the story is profound and recurrent and. I think it's worth just getting a taste. Yeah, let's do that. Really. Let's do that, and then let's see if we have any questions or right. comments from our audience. Yeah, nature's very important to Adler. Uh, uh, for one thing, he was part of the Wandervogel, uh, the 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 wanderers, the Boy Scouts, the, which eventually morphed into, were corrupted by, and became the Hitler Youth. Okay, they were not the Hitler Youth. This is important to stress. They were this, they're extremely idealistic, dignified concerned with honor. Um, so nature was always important to him. And throughout his novels, nature is a safe place. Nature is the place where he's free. Nature is the place where the world is restored again. So th and, this is, and he loved particularly the Bohemian forests of, of Western Czech Czech Czechoslovakia. And it's where, he, uh, in the novel, Arthur remembers walking with Franziska, who is the stand-in for Gertrude, uh, Adler's wife. I was never at home in these mountains, but always a stranger, yet more deeply enclosed than in any old city or anywhere in the country or the world. Never had a landscape been so alive to me in its sounds, stimulated more tastes or more smells. I loved it when the long beams of sunlight poured down, when the branches were warmed and the underbrush crackled. I loved it in the rain, when the water dripped heavily from the raspberry bushes, when layers of fog rose and fell, or the wind blew cool in summer or nearly toppled the trees in autumn, when the powerful blasts of thunderstorms threw sultry fear into the tall, rumpled crowns of the trees. I love the mountain forest in any weather, hardly known paths having carried me into it for many hours, where an always renewed sense of fullness, whose blessing was secured by the view, left me alone with myself, a man in the world of trees, a man not among men, a man with a chosen and friendly companion, a man next to Francisca's loveliness, she who felt herself the guardian of a secret realm amid the protection of the surrounding area, myself a man in the hidden reaches of the dense covering that granted me more freedom than the open fields because I remained unto myself rather than one continually searching and therefore unobserved, never locked out, never held back by fences, not warned to stay away and forbidden to enter. Nicely rendered. Very, very great. Okay. Um, why don't we see if there are any questions or comments? I'm curious about the what sounds like the continued resistance in Germany to Adler's writings. Mm. His, the novels that are, have been published are still in print, I assume. You Two of them. The editor who not only rejected the book but said he would not see it published in his lifetime or whatever his phrase was. Right. Um, it's, it's striking that there seems something more to this than a matter of a, a style in favor or not in favor. Yeah, yeah I mean, look, uh, Zabald himself was not read until discovered here in America. I mean, Susan Sontag's you know, New Yorker review or article, essay on his, on his work is the breakthrough moment. No one knew who Zabald was. He was this little guy running around collecting postcards um, and living in England. Um, and if you, yeah, you, not a, yeah, I would say Zebald has a greater reception. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's scholarship is now interested in him, but the public at large, um, there's a greater reception in in the states and in England than than in Germany. Um, I don't know. There's uh, Ernestine Schlant um, is a scholar uh, taught at. Was it Rutgers or it was or whatever? Has a wonderful book called *The Literature of Silence*, in which uh, it's uh, uh, she takes up a number of German writers and she really illustrates and shows how little there is on the Holocaust itself. If you think of Gunter Grass, right? If you think of Wolfgang Köppen, if, um, people are again writing around it. Um, we have lots of memoirs in Polish, Hungarian. Here's another astonishing fact. When I finish the journey, I have to write an introduction for it. And I say, well, who's like Adler? How, what German-speaking surviving Jews have written novels about their experience? There are four. Um, Jürgen Jakob Becker, uh, Jürgen Becker um, writes uh, Jakob the, 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 Jacob the Liar. Uh, 
uh, Edgar Hilsenrat writes a book called Night. He was in the Ukraine in a camp. And many years later, really not until the 1970s, is Fred Vander, uh, the seventh well, writing novels which are really kind of memoirs um, that, that turned into novels. Uh, and Adler is the fourth one. Um, again, you have to realize there are 500,000 Jews in Germany, 250,000 emigrate. How many novelists are you going to get out of 250,000 people, right? So it's just even a statistical. And then, of course, many of those 250,000 die. Um, so there four are, is still a pretty low number. It's four is yeah. still a very low number. Yes, exactly. And what's and, and he's writing in Auf Deutsch. You yeah. know, in other words, you know, the, a key word in the journey is Abfall, right? Garbage, uh, rubbish, but also you know the echoes of the fall of of man, right? He can play upon words like that. Uh, um, in, in German, so that's a very key aspect. So there is a, I, I, I don't want to say that Germany has ignored the Holocaust. They've, you know, more, they've given enormous amounts of attention to it, obviously. There's no question of that. But in fiction, there isn't a lot. There's, there is not a lot. And that's why, you know, it's not for me to say if Adler's a major writer, but, or, or not, or anything like that, but I think one of the, the importance of Adler is that engagement, that linguistic engagement with that experience, which has really not happened in, in German, German literature. How could it, right? I mean, how could it? Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, do you have one more thing, Leo? And then let's ask the gentleman in the back, and then we'll... Uh... Sebald himself wrote about the silence in sure. Luftkrieg und Literatur. Sure. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it, and yeah. the gentleman in the back. Who are the characters who are Steiner, George Steiner, and Kennedy's in the novel. Kennedy is Oswald Birch, um, uh, and uh, Steiner. I'm, I'm not sure. I was surprised you brought that up. Actually, I was. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I read that oh, really? Yeah. That's was the. It wouldn't surprise yeah. me at all. I mean, I would pick him. It's not so and so. I wouldn't think so and so is, is is. I think what I read was that he was crossed with so and so somewhere. Does that seem See, now it's Franz Bermann Steiner. You see, that's. I wonder if. It, no, they're, they're saying George Steiner. Okay. Yeah. You said then, Steiner. Yeah. So we're thinking it's so and so in the novel. Yeah. Okay. Lawrence Cowders. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not. not sure. Yeah. I'll have to ask Jeremy. That's the, he, what what he knows of that. I'm just curious about uh, Adler's relationship to the English language. I mean, obviously yeah. he lived in in England for quite a long time, and obviously he wrote in German. Mm. Uh, I'm curious what that relationship was, how it might have changed, was any of his correspondence, I suppose it would have been partially in English, and, and how might the English language have influenced his German over time? Yeah. Um, great question. Uh, his English was not good. I've heard interviews with him in his 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, where he spoke with extremely heavy accent and searched for English words. There's very little correspondence written in English. Uh, he read English a lot. So his, some of his, Joyce was an important, very important writer for him. Uh, and uh, you can see a lot of Joyce in his writing. Uh, uh, kind of the mythic quality or you know, following single characters through a journey, through their days. Um, uh, Wolf was another important writer, the, the multi-voicing uh, of the novels, uh, particularly the journey. Uh, I think you see that influence. He also considered where he considered himself to be homeless, that he was not at home in England, and he very much liked that. That a, a, England, he even talks about it in the novel. England is a place he could be safe, and people would leave him alone, and he lived in his own little world. His apartment, because Bettina, of course, spoke German, uh, um, his apartment was Deutschland. I mean, his apartment was the German language. He was at home in the German language, and that's really how he lived. He, he keeps a, uh, these pocket diaries where he records every letter that he receives every day and every letter that he writes. I mean, for a biographer, this is a dream. Uh, <laughs> this is a piece of cake. Um, so, and again, these letters are to Heinrich Böll, to Adorno, uh, you know, Kennedy. There are not many to Kennedy because Kennedy lived in London too, so they saw each other uh, socially there. Uh, but he was constantly in, in correspondence with uh, Germany, not Prague. He leaves Prague, never goes back to Prague. And ironically, dies in uh, August of 1988, a year later. 
you know, he would have seen. And, and what was, I mean, how did he communicate with his son? Did his son speak German with yes, him? Yes, bo uh, 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 both, but both. The, the son, uh, actually, the, the son really does grow up with English, but, they, but also German as a second language. I mean, Jeremy has an English accent and is English educated and mm -hmm. was a prof is professor at the University of King's College, London. So. There's a very nice essay by his son in the current issue of the TLS. He's a very way, good writer. Goethe and Henry James, so yeah. you'll have to yeah. check it out. Yeah. One last question, because we're just about out of time. It's not really a question, but I just wanted to contribute something to that, because there's this whole interesting history that um, I haven't explored, so I can't say much more about that, but if you go to the uh, German Literature Archive in Marbach, um, you will find that Adel also contributed to the emerging conceptual poetry scene, yes. and he collaborated with his son a little bit, and that's, I think, the only places where he, he actually wrote in English and in German. So he received some attention for like nonsensical language poetry oh. on that. Uh, so he did that too. That's a, that's a very good point, and, and that revived him as a poet, um, with Jeremy being in, becoming quite a talented young poet himself, and it revived Adler's interest in poetry so that he writes a lot of poems uh, later on in, in his life. Adler would go into a, 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 a restaurant and he would rhyme, particularly like a Chinese or an Italian restaurant, he would rhyme uh, the, the, the menu items. So he was very fixated on sound and <laughs> musicality and, and puns, loved puns and the, and the funny names. He'd keep long lists of, of character names, try, trying out different ideas for characters' names. So Okay, this has piqued our interest in the biography. One last question. When you're writing the biography now, when, yeah. when, when can we expect it? Uh, well, it's due March of 2016. So if I meet my deadline, then I would think about spring of 2017. Uh, that, that, Ox Oxford, Oxford University, University Press. Press is doing okay. it. Yeah. And, and uh, if, if I may, I was just thinking perhaps we could end by you reading another passage if you feel inclined, because I think it would be nice to have um, Adler's voice in the end, so to speak. There's nothing at all certain. Don't think that I'm just being contrary and don't believe in the real, the sublime, or even the holy. They're simply indefinable. People were much too certain and too many still are today. They fall into error, but when they are consoled by it, it must be all right. You can't stand in their way. Yet for me, it's not so. You have to be able to feel broken and yet not damn the world, to not become callous, not hate your neighbor, not the guilty, for they are, they are your neighbors. You can't separate them from those who are not guilty. Doubt and lack of faith are two very different things. Beware the one who exchanges one for the other or mixes them up. Avoid negation and embrace the end, even praise it, for the end is also a gift and is part of the plan. The end, oops, at the end, you submit yourself and accept your fate. Thank you all. Great way to end. Great ones. Thank you, George, Peter, and thank you for your wonderful thank questions you and observations.